short video where we talk about definition, so called the Laplace transform. The word transform is just another word for function, though it is used specifically or normally in a context where we're dealing with linear transforms. So, for example, we've already seen a transform. The linear uh, differentiator, uh, differential operator D is a special type of transform. And we're going to look at an integral transform. And the reason why we're looking at it is because it can simplify the solution of some initial value problems. So, what is an integral transform? Well, it is a function that takes an input function, performs an integral with the product of another function, producing an output function of a different variable. So this is how it's written. Let's examine each piece. So our lowercase function, f of t, is our input function. After we complete the integration, we'll get a new function. And by convention, we just change the letter from lowercase to uppercase. So the name of the output function will be uppercase f of s. The function that we multiply inside the integrand is called the kernel of the transform. And when we perform the anti-differentiation, perform the integration, we're treating s as a constant. So the output will be a formula in s, and that's going to be the formula for the uppercase f of s. And our choice for the kernel is e to the power of negative st. And that's what results in the Laplace transform. Now, I don't know the historical reason for choosing S, but I'm going to do my very best to make the S look like an S so that it does not get confused with the numeral 5. So let's take a look at the Laplace transform. The formal definition is we're going to look at functions which are defined from 0 to infinity, we're including 0. And then we're going to compute this integral. And the notation we use to denote the Laplace transform is this script L. Then we use brackets. And then we write our input function. And it's defined to be then the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. Now, this is uh, an integral, an improper integral, where we're going to have to take a limit. And recall that if that limit does not exist, then the uh, integral diverges. And if the limit does exist, it converges. So, and it's only defined when we have a convergent integral. Uh, so again, our convention is that uh, we're going to use lowercase letters for the names of the input functions, and the corresponding uppercase letter is the output function. So let's look at a couple of examples. Let's just look at what is the Laplace transform of the function f of t equals 1, a constant function. So we'll just have to evaluate the integral then from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st dt. And so that's a straightforward. We replace uh, our infinity symbol with a finite number b, and then we take the limit of, as b goes to infinity of the evaluation of the integral. So we have to evaluate the integral. So the bounds are from 0 to b. 
This is a negative 1 over s e to the negative st. That's the antiderivative. And so after the evaluation, I can factor out the negative 1 over s. I have e to the negative b times s minus 1. Now as b goes to infinity, as long as s is positive, this will be a negative exponent. And as b goes to infinity, that term will go to 0, which means I only have the negative 1 left over. So negative 1 times negative 1 over s is 1 over s. And so that's going to be true. That will exist provided that s is positive. If s were less than or equal to 0, we would get a divergent integral. Let's look at another example. Let's evaluate the uh, Laplace transform of the function f of t equals t. Well, let's go ahead and use the definition. So I'm going to have a, a t times e to the negative st in the integrand. And the way that you find the antiderivative is to use integration by parts. And so when I use integration by parts, remember that what I have is first my uv, and that will be evaluated between my bounds, 0 to b. And then this is minus the integral v du. And so uh, this integral I can uh, Evaluate. In fact, I can recognize that this integral, as b goes to infinity, is just the uh, Laplace transform of the function 1, which we already determined that to be 1 over s. So let's see what this is going to give us. So this part is going to go to 0. The, as long as s is positive, this negative or exponential function with a negative exponent will dominate the t term or the t factor here. So this whole thing will go to zero. Um, if you're not sure, you can always apply the L'Hopital's rule. Uh, and so, like I said, what we have here, this integral, the second integral is the integral that we had in our first example, and we know that that's going to be 1 over s, so I have 1 over s times 1 over s, which gives me 1 over s squared. All right, what would be the Laplace transform of e to the negative 3t? Well, now we just have the product of exponentials, so we can go ahead and uh, yeah, add the exponents, use the properties of exponents. And this is really essentially the same integral that we had when we did the integral of 1. It will just be a u substitution with u. And so um, all that means instead of getting 1 over s, we're going to get 1 over s plus 3. Again, in order to, to make that work, s plus 3 has to be bigger than 0. All right, and then here we have e to the positive 5t. So it's going to be very similar to example 3. I'm going to go ahead and use the uh, property of exponents. I'm going to keep it with a negative sign outside the, pro the parentheses. So that's a negative s minus 5 in there, uh, in, inside the parentheses. And the reason why I do that, because then it looks exactly like uh, the integral in example 3 and uh, similar to example 1. Again, we'll be making a, a u substitution here. And instead of having uh, a 1 over s plus 3, I should get 1 over s minus 5. All right. So here's the one, uh, an example where we have to do more work. It's not a terrible amount of work, 
particularly if you uh, have recently taken a Calculus 2 class, um, because now we have to evaluate the integral of e to the negative st times the cosine of 3t. And uh, the way that we evaluate that is to use integration by parts twice. So this is important enough that it's worth going through in detail. I'm just going to first calculate the antiderivative. Then I can apply the bounds, and then I'll take the limit. So let's say calculate the antiderivative. Uh, we're going to start by using uh, integration by parts. And remember, that gives me uv minus integral v du. And so now I've got to uh, use integration by parts twice again, because I still can't evaluate this integral. So I went ahead and did that. But now look what happens is that uh, I have my left-hand side is the integral of e to the negative st times cosine of 3t. And then over here on the right-hand side, I have some constant times that same integral. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and gather that as if it's a like term. They are indeed like terms. On the left-hand side then, so I had one of them. I added s squared over 9. So that's why I have in brackets here 1 plus s squared over 9. That's times the integral e to the negative st cosine of 3t. And then this is what's left over. Got a sine term and a cosine term. So what I'll do then is I'll write 1 plus s squared over 9 as 9 plus s squared over 9. So when I divide by that, I'll be multiplying by the reciprocal, which is 9 over s squared plus 9, times the expression in the brackets with the sine and the cosine. And so that's my antiderivative. So I said I was going to first take the antiderivative. The next thing I need to do is apply the bounds or evaluate it at those bounds from 0 to b. And then I'll need to take the limit. And that will give me the Laplace transform. So when I go ahead and substitute b and 0 in there, I have expressions that say e to the negative sb times sine of 3b, and then e to the negative sb times cosine of 3b. So as b goes to infinity, those terms are going to go to 0. And uh, then when I put in 0, so my lower bound, uh, for the sine of 0, I get 0. For the cosine of 0, I get 1. So I just get uh, negative s over 9. And so that will be a minus, a minus. That will make plus. Everything else is 0 or will go to 0 when you take the limit. And so I'm just going to multiply my constant here by s and divide by 9. And that gives me s over s squared plus 9. So the Laplace transform of cosine of 3t is s over s squared plus 9. Now, what makes the Laplace transform useful, and indeed almost every integral transform, is that it's linear. Well, what does linear mean when you're talking about linear transform? It means that the sum of the transform, I'm sorry, the transfer of, form of the sum is the sum of the transforms, plus if you have a constant multiplier, you can factor the constant multiplier out from the transform. So that's going to make evaluating things fairly simple. Because you say to yourself, well, I don't want to apply the definition for every type of function. Well, if you have a function which is built up 
from, so there is a linear combination of functions of which you already know the Laplace transform, then you can take advantage of this linearity property. So for example, the Laplace tra transform of 4t plus 3 would be 4 times the Laplace transform of t plus 3 times the Laplace transform of 1. We already figured those out. We have to use the definition. The Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared, so I'll get a 4 over s squared as my first term. And the Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s, so I'll have 3 over s. I can leave it as two fractions. Many times it's actually more useful as two fractions. Or I could go ahead and write it as a single fraction. So here are some Laplace transforms uh, that uh, we will be using. And if we get stuck, we can always go back to the definition. But these are worth learning. As we saw with the cosine function, uh, we had to do integration by parts twice. Uh, that can be very time consuming. But it leads to a very simple formula that's worth memorizing. And this whole table, then, is worth memorizing. Look what happens here with the power function. It's kind of interesting. So if you have t to the power of n, it's actually going to be a reciprocal with s in the uh, denominator. And it's going to have a power of n plus 1. So it kind of reminds us, and it makes sense in a way, that uh, if we're doing an integration, that we sh it re should remind us of the uh, power rule for integration. We have to increase the exponent by 1. The rest of it, well, we have an n factorial in the top. And this uh, formula is only valid for positive integer values of n. Uh, so let's see if we can use uh, that table in the future. Uh, we'd like to know when can we uh, find what are the conditions that are sufficient in order to be able to know that we have a Laplace transform of a function. Well, the function, input function, has to have two properties. Uh, so before we talk about those properties, just, just note that there's plenty of functions for which the Laplace transform does not exist. And here's two examples, right? The Laplace transform of 1 over t will not exist, nor will the Laplace transform of e to the power of t squared. Now, for 1 over t, is not even defined at 0. So one of the requirements is that the function has to be defined from 0 to infinity, including 0. And we'll see that the problem with this function, e to the t squared, is that it simply grows too fast. So the two conditions are that the function, input function, must be piecewise continuous on the interval from 0 to infinity. And well, what does that mean, piecewise continuous? That means if you take any values a and b, you have that closed interval, a comma b, uh, which are obviously a and b are in 0 to infinity, uh, then f of t has only a finite number of discontinuities on that bounded closed interval. So f of t can be a discontinuous function. It can have a jump uh, uh, discontinuities. Uh, but as long as in any closed interval you have a finite number, you're going to be okay. So that actually tells you that uh, you know f of t could have um, a, an infinite number of discontinuities. It's just that in any closed interval, any bounded closed interval, it can only have a finite number of them. So, for example, the greatest integer function, if you remember that, it's a step function. It has disc discontinuities or steps at all of the integer values. That would have a Laplace transform. 
the other issue is that uh, f of t is of exponential order. So this is our second condition. And what do we mean by exponential order? It means that it doesn't grow faster than an exponential function. Or precisely what it says is that you have to have positive constants c, m, and t, where f of t, or the absolute value of f of t, is going to be less than or equal to some constant times an exponential function. And that has to be valid, not for all t, but for all t greater than capital T. So it may have some really big values uh, early on that are not bounded by an exponential, but eventually the exponential has to be larger than the absolute value of the function. All right, so here's a demonstration where we can see that even if a function has a jump discontinuity, that the Laplace transform will exist. And how do we handle jump discontinuities in integrals is that we break it up into multiple integral at multiple integrals at the jump location. So here it jumps when t equals 3. And so we have our first integral going from 0 to 3, and the second integral from 3 to infinity. So we could just evaluate this, uh, taking the bounds to be 3 to b, and then letting b go to infinity. But here's another way that we could think about this, is we could think about the integral from 3 to infinity as being the integral from 0 to infinity and then subtract off the integral from 0 to 3. And why would I do that? Well, because if I have the integral from 0 to infinity, that's just the Laplace transform uh, of, well, this is e to the negative st is what I should have had there. Let me just put in an S. So e to the negative st, the integral of from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st dt is just the plus transform of 1. And then I can go ahead and evaluate this integral, which has finite bounds. It's going from 0 to 3, so no limit is required. I'll go ahead and take the antiderivative. Now I have the 2 over s. It'll be evaluated uh, from 0 to 3. That's multiplied by e to the negative st. And so... Uh, if I put in 3, I'll get e to the negative 3s. If I put in 0, I'll get 1. And so if I um, put those together, I seem to have made a mistake. No, I didn't, because the, I have 2 over s, but then I have a 2 over s times negative 1. So let's add to make 0, and I only have the exponential term left over. So uh, here's a, an interesting fact. It says that uh, if we have an output function, uppercase f, from a Laplace transform, then the limit as s goes to infinity uh, of f of s has to be zero. So that would tell us that there's you know, many functions of s that would could not be a the output function from a Laplace transform. So, for example, if you have a constant uh, f1 of s equals one, or if you have a function whose limit is not zero as s goes to infinity, uh, for example, f sub two of s is s over s plus 1. As s goes to infinity, that goes to 1. And why would this be important? 
it provides us a sanity check. If we get an output function from a, Laplace transform, or if we're trying to use Laplace transforms to help solve a differential equation, and we get a function that does not satisfy this property, then we know that somewhere we made a mistake, and we're going to have to go back and try to look at the algebra or the calculus or multiple steps to determine where did I make a mistake, because I know that this outcome is not possible.